Want to better understand yourself, others, and the best path for your life? Welcome to Authentic Living, podcast for a better life. The podcast where we delve into life themes and how learning who you authentically are can change your entire life. Here are your hosts, John Boris and Kim Ely. Hello and welcome. We're so glad y'all are back for another episode of Authentic Living, the podcast for a better life. And you're here with me, Kim Ely, and our amazing co-host, John Boris. Hello. Hello. And John, I am really curious to learn more about our topic today because it is all about risk. Right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And gosh knows, you know, people have very different risk tolerances, but I'm really curious to know how you decided to choose today's topic. Well, I was thinking about uh, Christmas and I'm thinking about gift giving. And uh, the idea is we like to give a gift that the the individual, the receiving uh, would like it. Mm -hmm. It would help them. They would use it and the positive impact in their life if we can. And so we go through this decision process of what do I get, George or Harry or Mary, whoever it might be. Mm -hmm. And so it's all about taking risks, what's safe, what's dangerous, et cetera. And then I started expanding that out and thinking of uh, everyday risk and Mm -hmm. how that comes about and our judgments of risk taking. And if we think it's reasonable or unreasonable, we judge other people and how they view risk also. Uh-huh. So I thought that'd be a nice podcast. Oh, I think that's a great idea. So just to clarify, when you're talking about risk for the holidays, you're not talking about standing on a ladder trying to decorate your house with holiday lights and the risk involved in that. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe. Oh, OK. <laughs> All right. OK, good deal. <laughs> so, so, yeah, I'm really curious to know about this, but I, I think there's a lot of risk in, and tell me if I'm on the right track with giving gifts and what we use to, you know, give to one another. That's right. That's how, what started it. And so I wanted to go through that because I wanted people to really see the power of the life theme Ooh. and the power of the archetypes in our life and how mm-hmm. it really does resonate everywhere. Oh, awesome. 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 So I'm thinking that how we react to risk differs. Well, it does differ, right? You have some people who are wild cards who take a chance on anything. And then there's some people who would play it's very safe. That's right. Absolutely right. But what's interesting is this can go expand actually out even into something like sales, Mm. relationships. Mm -hmm. There are are many ways people take risks every day, introducing themselves to other people. Some give their public speakers, they're risking whether or not they're going to give a good performance. The risk is really everywhere. Yes. So, you know, what I did is I, I looked up some statistics just for fun. Mm-hmm. And uh, Ooh. So, so what I found was, for example, people drowning in a bathtub mm-hmm. is one out of 83,000. Hmm. But wow. dying from uh, skydiving is one out of 100,000. What? That's crazy. Yeah. That's so close. <laughs> very, so very close. So the chances of drowning in a bathtub is very close to skydiving. Now, that doesn't make a lot of sense, but that's a statistic. Uh. Race cars. Race. There's not many race car drivers in the world. And the statistic is one out of 100 die in a crash eventually yikes which which is terrible but base jumpers is one out of 60 eek so driving a car in a race is safer than base jumping wow but when you get to accidents daily accidents Uh uh, 16 out of 100,000 wow very high like a daily car accident like in traffic yeah absolutely Oh, wow. So the thing is, is that my only point there is statistics <clears throat> are meaningless. We mm. do not base risk on statistics. But there's wow. people who are base jumpers that think that, let's say, skydiving is dangerous or reverse. 
And yet they're both one out of 100,000. Base jumpers are one out of 60. They're both relatively dangerous. So, but how do they make a decision like that and compare the two, regardless of who you are? Right. It doesn't matter. So with base jumping, is it one out of 60 or one out of 60,000? One out of 60. Mm -hmm. Oh, 60. Oh, wow. So speaking as somebody who personally has done skydiving twice and has actually, you might be surprised, flirted with the idea of doing a base jump. Oh, I'm a little more nervous now, now that I've heard that statistic. <laughs> consider. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. one out of a hundred thousand, it's like, oh, okay. You know, but that's a freak accident. Somebody packed the parachute incorrectly. One out of 60 is like, I'm, yeah. oh, snap. Yeah. That's a little scary. Yep. That's scary. <laughs> oh yeah. So if we're not looking at the statistics, Right. And we're really being motivated by an idea. Yeah. So like race car drivers are motivated by winning the race. Mm -hmm. uh, some people like to skydive because of being popular in the industry. And sometimes it's just recognition. Mm -hmm. But what it gets down to is the number one rule is the human mind only has one need. Mm -hmm. And that's the perpetual need to express our authentic identity through mm -hmm. our people and events. Mm -hmm. And so if that's the number one reason, everything else steps to the side, such as risk-taking and statistics. Ah, interesting. So it doesn't matter what the statistics are. Right. It matters who you are authentically. Huh, interesting. But it's all based on the idea of what would it be like to skydive mm -hmm able to tell my friends I did it. Gotcha. I would have the experience of it, but mm -hmm. then I'd be able to tell everyone that I did it. And so that would be fun. I would really, I think I'd like that. See, that's Would you go skydiving? No. Oh, 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 I thought, oh, oh, I thought you were saying you'd like to go. Theoretically. The no, oh, theoretically. theoretically. Okay. Gotcha. 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 So when it comes to all this and what's safe and what's dangerous and what's risk, it all gets down to who we are as an individual in our authentic identity is what's really moving it forward and making these choices for us in a sense. And mm -hmm. so I wanted to go a little further and say that the language we use in, in daily uh, events is an illusion. Hmm. Anyway, so mm -hmm. for example, marriage is an illusion that alludes to why two people share the same living space. Hmm. Okay. Marriage not exist. It does not live out in a field. It's not, it doesn't mm -hmm. grow out of the ground, doesn't fly, it has no weight. How <laughs> tall is it? How deep is it, right? Marriage mm -hmm. is an idea, just a concept that we came up with. So that little piece of paper, that yeah, that's why we marriage have certificate. It. Yeah. Just so we can say, to you. here's my paper to prove it. <laughs> here's my paper. Gotcha. Yeah. But still, it's just a concept. Like you said, you can't go out and go, hey, let's go look at our marriage. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So now also brother and sister could explain why two people mm -hmm. living together, male and female, mother and son, father and daughter. Mm -hmm. So these are terms we use to explain our position in the world, in a sense, or in this case, why two people live in the same house. Mm -hmm. Illusion. Gotcha. So what happens is our life gathers these illusions together. Mm -hmm. we, do it. We, we do it through choice because we have a sense of preference, which is ours, but it's ours mm -hmm. because it's what the life theme and our archetypes are doing which is directing our experiences. Mm, Each one. Gotcha. Love, mm -hmm. justice, wisdom, and power. They're all directing our experiences. And so what that does is generate our sense of value. Mm -hmm. and our values accumulate into judgments, and that shapes our worldview. Gotcha. So... What might be an example of this in IRL, in real life? What might be a good example of, I'm going to say, a risk and how it's part of someone's authentic identity? Very good. I went and studied stocks, bonds, real estate, and commodities as mm -hmm. in investments. Mm -hmm. And studied the people who made quite a bit of money in doing so. So, for example, take stocks. 
Mm-hmm. Warren Buffett made his money through stocks. In his mind, after reading his autobiography, mm-hmm. what he did is he said, investment, it'll always be a risk, but it shouldn't be an unreasonable risk. Mm-hmm. If you have enough information. So mm-hmm. what he did is he was a wisdom person. Uh-huh. And for him, learning was everything. Yeah. And if you study hard enough, you would be able to make a reasonable risk and buy stocks. So gotcha. buying stocks really conform to his authentic identity. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, but if he were to buy bonds, that wouldn't. Ah. Because it's a whole different concept. Bonds are just, you buy a bond, quite often it's government, local institutions. Mm-hmm. All you're doing is lending your money in your bond. And you have income. It's a steady fixed amount that comes in. And so there's not a lot of excitement to it. There's not a lot of risk. It's not, Yeah, there's not a lot of risk and there's no, nothing really to learn. Right. I mean, there's learning involved, but not compared to stocks, my point. Right. So bonds I've always heard are, are slow and steady right. earners. But stocks, especially, there's some stocks that are pretty reliable. What are they called? Blue chip or something like that? Like the, what is it called? Like IBM and some of the other ones that are kind of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then there's like super risky stocks, like startup companies, things like that. Oh, certainly, yes. Oh, absolutely. Well, so now Warren Buff would do a complete analysis, whatever stocks he was looking at. That's my point. But he's a wisdom person. He's going to take the time to do it. Right. A bond person is not that interested in that. They right. want to find something that's secure, reliable, dependable, and they don't want to take a great risk. Gotcha. Am I right? <laughs> you are right. Based on my relationship with wisdom people, I would say that's correct. <laughs> exactly. But the idea is that this all really is an illusion. What gives us a sense of stability is our authentic identity and the life uh, theme is what's directing our experiences so that we can have a feeling of Mm -hmm. stability, a feeling of control, Mm -hmm. a feeling of being able to predict the future to some extent. I know that when I walk out the door, I'm not going to be hit by a satellite. Or chances are, okay? Chances are. Very unlikely. Right. So Warren Buffett is a wisdom person. Have you looked into some other successful investors? Sure. Archetypes. Uh, You have Bill Gross, funny off bonds. And what he liked, it's a fixed income. And there wasn't a great deal of risk. uh, Mm -hmm. Uh, and so what he talked about is the feeling of contentment, the feeling, the, the lack of, I would say, the lack of insecurity, mm-hmm. constantly worrying about collecting the money from a bond. And so what he felt was it's very reliable. That's my point. Mm-hmm. So then we have uh, Warren Buffett, We I said, then we oh. have commodities, pardon me? Wait, we didn't share Bill Gross. What's his archetype? What's his life theme? Love. What is it? Love. Oh, love. Okay, gotcha. So explain why he, as a love person, would be attracted to bonds. Well, actually, through his autobiography, he talked about the bonds he bought were from companies and also government agencies that he really cared about. Ah, gotcha. Gotcha, gotcha. Then Very we have- cool. Stocks, of course, Warren Buffett, wisdom. And the idea Mm -hmm. is to, you have to really investigate uh, your stocks and do a lot of research, a lot of work. And, but Mm -hmm. he's loved. So, in his set, both of these, one is love and the other one's wisdom. And they Mm -hmm. feel I am expressing my authentic identity Mm -hmm. using my intuition in buying uh, stocks or buying bonds that I feel safe. I feel safer. Then yeah. I bought something different. Ah, okay. Gotcha. 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 And then we have Jim Rogers, which shows mm-hmm. for commodities. And commodities are what you buy, such as the metals and livestock, the meat, agriculture. The commodities are basic, basically used for manufacturing other products, et cetera. But what he focused on was using both logic and observation. Mm-hmm. And he also looked at it from a balanced position. Mm-hmm. 
mm-hmm. which is justice. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that's, and he made, well, his net worth was $300 million. And I should say Warren Buffett was $7.7 billion. Wow. Um, and gross was $2.2 billion. That's what his net worth is. So they were able to use their intuition in investing and they made a lot of money. Yeah. But it's a type of investment related to the type of authentic identity. Right. And then I did this several years ago. So Mm -hmm. my power person is, the power is real estate. Mm -hmm. And the reason is they are looking for a token of their power. They need something physical. They need something visible to Mm -hmm. point to and talk about. And of course, at that time, that was uh, Donald Trump. (laughs) <laughs> that totally fits. <laughs> so Donald Trump is definitely a power person. That that's how he invested his money. And so getting back to the idea of risk, danger, and safety, as you mm-hmm. can see, again, it goes back to your authentic identity, your life theme, and how it's constantly directing you in everything in life. Right. Okay. So it is so predictable. And just, it's always there and always working. And so if you think about the dynamics of your authentic identity, Mm -hmm. wherever you look in your life, you'll find it. Whether it's investing, whether it's relationships, whether it's what you like and care for or dislike, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. And so I thought that was uh, very interesting. And especially during uh, the holidays, But the idea is that we create the illusion, all this language is an illusion that we create in order to refer to or allude to our Mm -hmm. physical justice position in the world. What are we physically doing in the world? It's based on illusions. Oh, wow. So I think this is a good place for us to take a short break, but let's dive back into that because I think that's really interesting to investigate is concepts and illusions. (laughs) After a quick break, John and Kim will be back with more of Authentic Living, podcast for a better life. Hi, I'm Kim Wells Ely, and with my company, Kiwi Publishing, K-W-E Publishing, I help take people from idea to publish book. But you know about me. I want to share with you today is about an amazing nonprofit called Podium RVA. It's fantastic. They work with public schools, youth development networks, and community centers across the greater Richmond area to bring writing, communication, and leadership workshops to RVA youth. Podium mentors meet weekly all year long with youth in workshops, preparing them for participation in podium publications, such as their annual literary journal and quarterly zines, and showcases to share their creative voices with the larger communities. It's a super fun, amazing group, and I love what they're doing. So check out PodiumRVA.org and support them today. They're amazing. Welcome back to Authentic Living, podcast for a better life. Here's John Boris and Kim Ely. All right, we are back. And we alluded a little bit to the illusions of risk. Woo! I don't know why I feel like I want to do like a David Copperfield illusion kind of thing. But I think it's really interesting to explore because we have the concepts of reasonable risks and unreasonable risks. And we usually take those to be like rock solid, unshakable things, right? Yeah. When in but actuality, they're myths. Ha ha. How so? Be yeah. Sure. Because it is dependent on a life theme, mm-hmm. which is trying to direct us in a one form of expression. And so my idea of unreasonable risk is going to be different than yours in, in many instances, not all. Mm-hmm. That's only because it's the life theme doing the directing. And so when it comes to the two of us are just going to say, I think, let's say skydiving is unreasonable. (laughs) You did it. But for me, skydiving is unreasonable. Why? Mm -hmm. Because I have no control. I don't know for certain what will happen. Ah, interesting. See, that's my criteria. So as a wisdom life theme, I'm thinking, and tell me if I'm on the right track, 
you would look into skydiving. Well, you probably wouldn't look into skydiving. You probably dismiss it. But if you were to look into it, you would do research on it. Correct. You would ask lots of questions about it. What would go into your thought process with that? I want to know as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to rely on information from other people. I want to get only expert opinion. Then Then even the word opinion kind of bothers me. I want to get facts if I can. Ah, gotcha. 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 What if here's a hypothetical. It wasn't skydiving as a recreational activity. What if you signed up to be part of the military and part of your training involved skydiving out of airplanes as a wisdom life theme? How would you approach that? I would first find out that that was part of what I would be doing. Okay, that makes sense. See, I'd first know. Now, to go further, if I Mm -hmm. knew that that would be part of my activities, Mm-hmm. then that alone would stop me from protesting. Interesting. Why? Because that was my decision. That was my authentic decision uh, to go ahead and forward because I know that's what was coming up. Gotcha. Some people would say, well, yeah, I kind of knew it, but no, I'm not going to do that. Well, mm-hmm. that's not a wisdom person. That could be a justice or it could be a love, uh, mm-hmm. it could be a power. But a wisdom person, once they know, that really locks them in. Gotcha. So what are some other reasonable risks, unreasonable risks? Well, how about mountain climbing and base jumping? And But even if, when you drive a car, that's a risk. But what's interesting is no one really looks at it that much as, as a risk because that, there are 16 deaths per 100,000, which is high. Yeah, that is high. Okay? And so like I said, drowning in a bathtub is one out of 83,000. Right. But yet, no, I've never heard anybody say, oh, you know, Kim, you better not take a bath. Are you crazy? (laughs) You know, what are you doing? But I definitely did hear that with skydiving. So that's so interesting, the reasonability and the unreasonability. I often heard, (laughs) and in fact, it was kind of made into a joke. I think it was people who were studying accidents would say the majority of car accidents would happen within a mile of someone's house. And the old joke was the husband tells the wife, oh, majority of car accidents happen a mile away from your home. And she goes, oh, no, honey, we should move. (laughs) (laughs) I I never heard that. You never heard that? I thought that was pretty clever. But it's true. If we, like, especially as Americans, and especially depending on where you live, we're pretty dependent on cars, right? If you live in a place like New York City or Chicago, you don't have to have a car. But if you're in California, like you are, or Virginia, like I am, you're not going to get very far if you don't drive a car. So if somebody was really paranoid, like I remember some people in my driver's ed class got really scared about driving. You know, they showed us these gosh awful movies you know, designed to scare teenagers to driving reasonably. And so I remember friends of mine being like, oh, I'm not going to get my driver's license. Hmm. And I was like, is that reasonable, though? Because if you want to hold a job, you know, if you want to visit your family, presuming that you could hop in the car and do that, if you want to do almost any function, are you going to basically shut down your life because you feel like it's unreasonable to drive? Unreasonable for the uh, reason of danger? Mm Mm-hmm. Hmm. Well, that's going to the extreme. Um, it, it is. Yeah, I, I agree with that. That's not an area. Now I think you're almost getting into a neurosis. Oh, oh, OK. Gotcha. OK. So, so when we're talking about reasonable and unreasonable, that's a good qualifier. We're talking about not a neurosis. We're talking about with, yeah. quote unquote, if someone, normal people. If really somebody. Now, here's a different. I will say this. Yeah. So, Sometimes when I'm assessing someone, I would say, well, why do you need a car? Why do I need to get around? Okay, Mm -hmm. that's fine. But why do you need a car? You can walk. Well, I can't walk to work. Why not? Well, because work is 12 miles away. So why don't you walk? Well, I don't want to walk. Why? (laughs) I don't want to. And that's the answer. I just don't want to. Right. It's really about desire. Right. And want. And the logic of it is irrelevant. It's uh, David Hume. He was a 17th century Scottish philosopher who said that logic and reason are actually the slaves of our passions. Ooh. 
And that's interesting. That's, that's exactly right. Mm-hmm. And that's what we've been talking about. It's the illusion of language mm-hmm. and how we feel about them mm-hmm. and how you feel about risk. What is safety to you? How mm-hmm. you feel, and how you feel about danger. Because there's a many people do, cra- in my mind, crazy things. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. How about scuba diving in caves? <laughs> now that, oh, that, that terrified me. I couldn't do it. OK, because there's nothing about that I would be certain of. Right, right. People do die in, in that situation, but they're getting a thrill and excitement that I would never get. Right. OK, right. so you gets down, not logic and reason. In fact, really, what we really do is we feel what we want and then we use logic and reason to get it. Ah, OK, gotcha. Gotcha. So getting back to risk and getting back to what's unreasonable and reasonable, it's all about feel. Mm -hmm. But what's interesting is we start this feeling even in the womb. Really? Yes. Doctors would explain that the way in which the the infant, I guess, in utero um, would express themselves Mm -hmm. has a certain type and kind Hmm. similar to personality. But the other one is when you can be three, four, five, even younger, two, mm-hmm. and we, we have a sense of right and wrong already. Mm-hmm. And a good one, a good example of that is children who were molested. Mm. Yeah. Very young, but this is wrong. They just know it. Yeah. Where did they get that? Yeah. So that goes back to genetics that I explain in another podcast, but also to the expression of genetics and how that generates and gets our sense of values, right, wrong, good, and bad, prepared to be triggered. Right, right. So they are triggered. And so this is what it means to be human. That These are the capacities and, and faculties that we have that we're born with, and then we go out in the world and trigger them. But we trigger them in a way that conforms to the authentic identity. So you saying that is interesting. And we talked a little bit about this. But when you mentioned triggering, I was thinking of gift giving and risks involved because so many people feel triggered by the fear of giving the wrong gift and things like that. How does the risk involved in gift giving relate to each archetype? Well, know that you are, let's say I'm giving a gift to an archetype. Yeah. Well, you give a gift that will empower the power. Mm, Okay. You would give a gift of that caring gift to the loved person. Mm -hmm. You would empower or enhance the wisdom of the wisdom person. Mm Mm-hmm. And you would give a sense of something that would balance out something they feel you feel is missing in someone else's life. And it would help them balance out their life in the justice part. Justice. Mm, gotcha. And so when you think about, okay, let me ask you, <clears throat> what is the most memorable gift you received? Oh, gosh. It would be my kitchen mixer. Because... I was not expecting it, but my husband absolutely knew that I wanted to have this stand-up mixer. I was just thrilled. And why? (laughs) Why would you want a mixer? I wanted a mixer because I love to cook and bake. And so I wanted to use the mixer so I could cook and bake delicious stuff for me and my husband and my family. Why? Oh, Because I love cooking for them. I don't know. I just really enjoy it. Because that's the expression of your authentic is love, right? Right, right. So the mixer, you see my the connection? Yes. Think of what does that person like the most? Mm-hmm. I, I like doing for my family. Okay, what do they do now that I can enhance? Gotcha. And the, the cooking and baking, everybody gathers around and is connected through the food. So the mixer is a tool that enables me to Further that connection. <laughs> Absolutely. 
So what, for a wisdom person, for me, think of in what way did that individual expand their knowledge? What do they like to do that helps them do that? And so right. for me, if it would be a coupon at a local bookstore, it would be wonderful. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> And there's many others. There's technical people out there that are in the wisdom and they would have a different type and kind of gift that would help their knowledge base. The idea is to give something to them that would expand who they are already. Right, right. Gotcha. Oh, very cool. So if somebody is puzzled, they're like, oh, snap, I need to get a gift for my let's say teacher or my colleague or, you know, need to purchase this gift, but I don't know what to get. Well, the very most helpful thing would be to do an assessment. Right. And that, that would be a darn good gift, John. I think we could say that would be a good gift. What could be a way for people to figure out, let's say you're buying something for your teacher. How would you figure out, you know, maybe what archetype they are, what, what life theme they are? Oh, what course are they teaching Ah, so an English teacher versus a, I don't know why this came to mind, mortuary services teacher. (laughs) (laughs) That was kind of (laughs) weird. So it depends on what they're teaching. Tell tell us more. Well, so an English teacher, I could easily see one of the gift would be a dictionary. Ah, love that the words. Goes yeah. back to the 17th century or 18th century because the language does change. Let's say anything affiliated with literature, mm-hmm. uh, sometimes there's a book series that you can get. Always look at what is in, present in their life now. Gotcha. So, hearkening. You know, okay. With so many tests with personality, et cetera, or they'll ask hypothetical questions. Mm-hmm. And the demand imaginary answers. Mm -hmm. And so you'll get a general idea, but that's all you'll get. But if I ask you, what car do you have right now? And you say, uh, you say, let's see, you had a Prius and what what was the other one? Oh, Prius. And and now we have a Tesla. Tesla. So what that does, it tells me a little bit about the two of you, not just you. Right. Right. And so... It's a fascinating fascination with machinery. Mm-hmm. Also, it's to help the planet. Yes. Okay, so that tells me that could be that your husband could be could be either justice or love. Mm. Yes, is justice. He is justice. You're right. <laughs> and so the machinery gave it away. And so many wisdom people drive a Tesla out of being fascinated with the mechanics of it. Right. If I could understand, sure. So back to the English teacher would be mm-hmm. to what period history uh, mm-hmm. is the most. Mm-hmm. And sometimes buying old books, for example. Ah. Oh, yes. Mm-hmm. So my daughter's got me a book, Edgar Allan Poe, that was printed in the 1800s. Oh, cool. And so um, I also have one that's about Plato uh-huh. that was printed in 1700. Wow. Late 1700s, yeah. So what does that mean to you? Why do you prize these books? Oh, because there's knowledge in there, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so that the type and kind of knowledge could possibly enhance my state of awareness. Yeah. My knowledge, which is what I do every day. Yeah. What does the fact that you have 1800s or 1700s volume what does that mean to you i think of the people who touch that <gasps> Ooh, interesting i mean to think about a book lasting that long it's amazing right and so i uh, just to think about all the people that had touched that and read it and studied it and then i also look at the ink mm-hmm. i look at how they spelt in those days which is very different and after a while you can read it it was a little practice the, you know the very old english it seems like Language changes about every 200 years that uh, moves from one type to another. Anyway, so the idea, and of course, it was my daughter that gave it to me. There we go. Awesome. Well, it all comes together. Yeah. So when it comes to gift giving, think about what do they like to do now? Also, I will have to throw in here rejuvenation because that's something that the audience probably is not aware of. But 
-hmm. what you do to break away from your daily life and enjoy yourself that's very separate from what you actually do, that that is a focal point of gift giving as well. Oh, excellent. Yes, that's a a really good point. And it's so interesting as part of authentic systems, the rejuvenation, because I found it surprising that what someone does for the rejuvenation almost seems counter in a way to their authentic identity. Like when you shared with me as a love person, like for instance, I love movies and television shows that are about chaos and utter confusion and things like that, which seems to go against my love theme. But really, I love that kind of thing because I love bringing, you know, bringing the chaos together into harmony. (laughs) Very good. Yeah, it's yeah, absolutely. That's how that works. Yeah. Um, step into your version, your style, type and kind of chaos the unknown. What I like to do is take long trips. Ah. And so what I do is I know where I am. Yes. Mm -hmm. But I don't know when someone is coming out of another side street, the people, what they wear, what they're doing. All this is different and new and every moment is new. And so that's rejuvenation for me. So that's rejuvenation for you, I'm guessing, because as a wisdom person, you like knowing about things. So going on the long trips is pleasant surprises. It's controlled chaos. <laughs> controlled chaos. What a good way to put it. Okay. Yeah. Because I'm in control of the chaos that I'm involved with. Some people go to the beach and watch the ocean, but maybe uh, take a walk. Some people like to go to the gym. Mm-hmm. And because, it, but when you look at their authentic identity and compare it to the gym, you'll see how it is different and how their regular self is being put on hold for a while. Fascinating. Oh my goodness. So I think that's a really good point is to incorporate or identify how that person with that life theme incorporates rejuvenation into their world. That's right. That's right. So if you want to buy a gift for them and you know what they do when they get off work, for example, maybe they like computer games, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. a computer game. They would love it. So that's the idea is either rejuvenation or something to help them express their authentic identity. Either way would work. Oh, fascinating. So on that topic, I think this would be an excellent time to mention that if people wanted to do an assessment First of all, that would be an amazing gift. But also, how would they go about doing that, John? What would they do? Email me directly, john at authentic-systems.com or to go to johnvoris.com. Excellent. I highly recommend it because truly, 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 it has changed aspects of my personal life, my professional life. I can't state enough how much I use authentic systems, truly. So I would definitely suggest that people look into that. And if people just had questions in general for you, John, are you open to that? Absolutely. And I do respond uh, on the email. Yes. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you so much. This has been fascinating. And I always learn so much. And a lot of this is going to totally stick with me. So thank you so much for sharing that. And listeners, I hope this was amazing for y'all as well and eye opening. If it was, share with us what you learned. And we'll look forward to seeing you next time. All right. This concludes another episode of Authentic Living, podcast for a better life. Thanks for spending time with us. Hope you join us again soon.